All right, so today we are going to be doing in lab enzymes and digestion. So we're going to have a bunch of different molecules, and let's talk first about what our molecules are and what we're doing. So we've got macromolecules. Macromolecules. And these are things like proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, which we won't be digesting in here. And we're going to want to digest these things and turn them into small things. So our macromolecules is a class. We're going to want to turn into some kind of monomers or individual building blocks. So what's that going to be? For our proteins, what do we have? We have amino acids. And so our amino acids, as you recall, have the structure something like this. Oopsie. So here is an amino acid. You remember the structure, your alpha carbon, your side chain, you've got an amino terminus, you have a carboxy terminus. So this is an amino acid. This is a representative amino acid. And this is what makes it protein. So we've got chains of these forming proteins, and this is the monomer. Carbohydrates, these are starches and sugars. So complex sugars. You probably remember that carbohydrates are made of things like simple sugars. So let's go back to our, uh, well, simple sugars, for example, like glucose. So you would have something like this. So here is a typical glucose molecule. This would be a monosaccharide. Remember our monosaccharides. So our carbohydrates are going to be made up of monosaccharides. This is our monomer. Lipids. You probably remember lipids are our fats. These could be triglycerides. These could be things like cholesterol. We're specifically going to look at triglycerides in here. So I'm going to erase my amino acids and my monosaccharides, but I will put them on the board to remind you that proteins will break down into amino acids. Carbohydrates will be broken down into monosaccharides. And our lipids, we're going to be looking specifically at triglycerides. They will break down into fatty acids. And you probably recall our structure of our fatty acid molecule is going to have a glycerol molecule and to that, we're going to have an ester linkage to a fatty acid, which I'll just do like this. And we remember we created these things via dehydration synthesis. And I'll forget my little ester linkage here. And some of these fatty acids, as you recall, will be saturated, meaning they have every single available hydrogen atom that you can stick on the carbons, because we have no double bonds, or they can be unsaturated, in which case they have a double bond and that usually introduces some kind of kink in the molecule. So these are our triglycerides, and that would be an example of one of our lipids here. And we're going to break down tri triglycerides into fatty acids. So you probably recall that a triglyceride is formed of three fatty acids on the glycerol molecule. So we're going to take the fatty acids off the glycerol molecule. And this is going to give us a fatty acid molecule. And the reason it is called a fatty acid, and I could go ahead and draw our long hydrocarbon tail here. We could draw it out. It goes on for a while. So forth, and it continues on. But we notice at the head of it, a carboxyl group. And of course, our carboxyl can lose a proton. Hence, carboxylic acid. So our fatty acid is an example of a carboxylic acid. So this is going to be acidic in nature. And that's going to get us to, when we talk about the use of indicators, this is how we're going to know when we have the presence of fatty acids. We'll use a litmus indicator. So before I get into that, let me just remind you of the basics here of what we're doing. So we're breaking down these large macromolecules into our 
are component parts, monomers. In the case of lipids, fatty acids really aren't monomers because they're linked to the glycerol molecule, but for our purposes, we'll consider them the smallest component that we're going to break this down into, right? So what do we use to do this? We use enzymes. So we have enzymes that are going to break these down. And the enzymes that we use for proteins are proteases. And you probably remember when we talked about one specific one, when we talked about digestion, we talked about pepsin. And if you recall, pepsin is a proenzyme, pepsinogen, that is produced by the stomach so that the stomach doesn't digest itself. Remember, you got to pull the pin on the grenade before you throw the grenade. So pepsinogen is the inactive form. So we'll have to cleave part of the polypeptide off because it is a protein. All enzymes are proteins here. So we're going to have to cleave part of that polypeptide off to get the active form pepsin. And that is done by using a low pH. So in order to make this reaction go, we will have to add hydrochloric acid, right? So hydrochloric acid. So we're going to need to lower the pH in order for pepsinogen to become pepsin. But the enzyme we are going to use is pepsinogen, and we're going to add hydrochloric acid. The protein that we're going to digest is albumin, same stuff you find in egg whites, this kind of stuff. So we're going to digest albumin with pepsinogen, and we're going to convert it into pepsin using hydrochloric acid, and we would expect to get amino acids. Our car carbohydrates, you probably recall from our discussion in digestion that we use amylases. So we've got a lingual like uh, amylase, we've got the salivary amylase, which is produced in the mouth. We have a pancreatic amylase, which obviously is produced in the pancreas. For this lab, we will be using pancreatic, pancreatic amylase. And pancre pancreatic amylase will take these starches and turn them into smaller polysaccharides down to monosaccharides. So we're going to see some monosaccharides coming out of this, our simple sugars. And obviously lipids, we're going to use a pancreatic lipase for this. So we're going to use pancreatic lipase to turn our lipids from triglycerides into fatty acids. And so if you think about triglycerides, think about milk, cream, this, these kinds of things. So triglycerides are actually going to be slightly basic. But what happens when we pull the fatty acids off? Well, then we're going to get carboxylic acids, remember? So we're going to be converting something that's very slightly basic into something that's acidic. All right, so these are enzymes. These are our macromolecules. We are digesting these enzymes. So what does that mean? That means this is a catabolic process. We're going to be taking these large molecules and breaking them down into little pieces. So catabolic, taking apart. So enzymes can either be catabolic, which the ones we will be using are, almost all enzymes for digestion are catabolic. And then of course later, when we have these raw materials, so to speak, that we've extracted from our macromolecules, our bodies can use anabolic enzymes to build these up into the desired products. So we have our own set of proteins that we want. We have our own types of sugars. For example, we're going to store our energy as glycogen. What we're going to digest is starch. And starch is a similar way that plants will store glucose molecules. And we store it as glycogen, which is a slightly different way of linking these things together. But basically, we're going to make our own things in our body from these raw materials. And we would have, in order to do that, we would have anabolic enzymes. But we're going to focus on the digestion because digestion is basically taking the large things that we ingest and breaking them down into the raw materials that we can use. And we do that using catabolic enzymes. Now, another thing that we're going to need is we're going to have to check, well, did we get our reaction? Did we get the expected amino acids? Did we get the monosaccharides that we were expecting? Did we get the fatty acids? Well, to do this, we're going to use a substance called an indicator. An indicator indicates the presence of stuff. So we can use different indicators to indicate the presence of proteins. <laughs> so we're going to use something called Burette's test for this. And Burette's test is basically, and, B 
burette, I can never spell it. Burette's test or the burette test uh, is also sometimes known as a Kutrowski test, which I like that name better, it's easier for me to say. So in any case, what we're gonna use the burette's test is to test for the presence of peptide bonds. So large proteins will have lots and lots of peptide bonds. The smaller the proteins, the fewer peptide bonds they'll have, and amino acids, the others that don't have any peptide bonds anymore. So when we use burette test, we're going to see that it's going to change color as we break these things down into smaller, smaller bits. So if you put burette test into a protein or something that contains protein, now mind you, it has to be a, a aqueous solution of protein. You can't just have protein and dump the stuff on it. It's going to turn a purple color. So in the presence of protein, in the presence of protein, it's purple. Presence of protein, I'll get this right. It's purple. But as we break it down smaller, we're gonna get it turning into a lavender color. So sort of this color here. So a lighter colored lavender. And that is going to indicate that we've broken down a lot of these larger proteins into amino acids if when we put our indicator in, it starts as purple and then it ends in lavender. So basically, it can tell us the degree to which we've broken down the proteins. Another thing that we will be using for our carbohydrates, we'll be using something called Benedict solution. Benedict starts off blue. And in the presence of monosaccharides or any reducing sugars, and I'm not going to get into exactly what those are, but things like glucose, fructose, these kinds of things. We will see this color change, and it will change eventually to orange in the presence of monosaccharides. And if we let it go long enough, and we've completely saturated this thing with monosaccharides, it will change to red. During a partial change, you know, while we're in the process of this, it'll go through green. So we'll start off with this kind of pale blue color that's transparent, and the blue will progress, the next is blue to start with. It will progress through green, orange, and maybe even eventually red as we break down these carbohydrates into monosaccharides. And since our carbohydrate is starch, we can also sort of look at this from a different point of view. We can take the, the question as, have we broken it down to monosaccharides or have we not broken it down? So we can also test for the presence of starch. And to do this, we use a, an iodine potassium iodide solution. And there's a similar solution called Lugol solution, very similar, and we both use potassium iodide. We're gonna use IKI, or I'd call it icky. And basically, you put this in, it's kind of a brown color. And if there's no starch, if there's starch, it turns a really deep purple blue. And we're talking really dark purple blue, darker than I have a marker, darker than my marker. So dark purple blue, it will turn dark purple blue in the presence of starch. And if there's no starch, it will remain this kind of transparent brownish color. So we're going to test our carbohydrates when we do this to see if we have broken them down. If we have broken them down, then our Benedict solution should turn orange or red. If we haven't, then our Lugol or Icky solution turn, should turn to purple or blue. So in this case, we're kind of testing it both ways, how effective our pancreatic amylase was. Finally, we've got our pancreatic lipase, and for this, we're going to use a litmus cream. Litmus cream. And litmus cream is just basically litmus that's been added to cream. So the litmus is actually going to be built in, or I should say the indicator will be built in to our substrate because we've already added the litmus cream to the cream. For the litmus, for the um, Lipids, I should actually write what we're using here. We're gonna use albumins, albumins. Here, it's gonna be starches or starch. Here, it's gonna be litmus cream, which is just a cream that has this litmus built into it or added to it. So the litmus cream is going to start off blue, kind of a bluish color in basic 
bluish purpley color and basic, and as it turns acidic, it's going to turn pink. So we would expect to see that our litmus cream, which starts off this kind of bluish lavender blue color, should change to pink in the presence of fatty acids. The other thing that we are going to expect is we are going to expect that when this conversion occurs, the fatty acids are gonna smell kind of sour, right? So when cream and milk turn sour, it smells well sour. So another way you can test very carefully is you take the test tube with the stuff and you waft it toward your nose. Now this should not be something that's toxic, but remember these are chemicals, these are in a lab, and you don't want to be just sniffing some unknown substance. So always, just to remind you, when you waft the substance, just very, very gently waft it toward your nose and take a very small whiff. If you picked up a, an unknown and it were potassium cyanide and you did that, you'd die. This is why we have to be very, very careful in the lab. No, we're not using any potassium cyanide in this experiment, no worries. But just to let you know, you always be very careful when smelling anything in the lab. Because we know that we start with lipids, we know that we started with a cream, and we're looking for fatty acids, then this is a safe substance. You know, this is just like pulling spoiled milk out of your refrigerator. Now, how do the enzymes work? Let's talk a little bit about the enzymes. In every single one of these experiments, when we put these things in, we let them incubate because we're trying to simulate the body. So we're going to incubate them at 37 degrees centigrade. And that's to mimic the same temperatures in the body that we would be conducting these digestions. So we have an incubation chamber and we stick our test tubes in there and it's just a water bath and it's covered and it's 37 degrees centigrade because we want to mimic the body temperature, obviously. Now, when we do the proteins, and I'm going to go, I'll get some PowerPoints that I'm gonna put up a little bit later that walk you step by step through this process. But we are going to see the step by step process and we're going to see that we're gonna to have to add hydrochloric acid in order to make this reaction run because to digest proteins into amino acids, we need to convert our pepsinogen into pepsin. That is why we add the hydrochloric acid. Now, technically, we're gonna try this without adding hydrochloric acid as well as a control. And we'll run it in the same way. We'll put it in the, the, the water bath. And we would not expect to see breakdown into amino acids because we will not have activated the enzyme. Now, for example, with our carbohydrates, um, when we do the digestion of the carbohydrates, it will be done in a very similar way. We're going to stick it in the water bath. And we're going to use our Benedict solution. And one thing that's very interesting about the Benedict solution is it takes heat to activate this thing. So you can't just add the Benedict solution and expect it to work. You actually have to put these things in a water bath. And we will put it at a very high temperature, much higher than in the incubator, the 37 degree incubator. We're gonna put this in a flask and we're just gonna put the, the flask on a hot plate. And that's gonna allow us to activate the Benedict solution. So without heat, Benedict solution will not be an indicator. So we need Benedict plus heat in order to run this reaction. And while you put this stuff in here, you will notice that as the Benedict is reacting because the, the Benedict is going to react with the monosaccharides, it's going to change through these colors. It will turn from blue to green to orange during the 10 minutes that we have it in our hot water bath. All right, one other thing I would like to note is the burette test is a two-part process as well. The burette test, we have to start off with sodium hydroxide because we need, in order to see the burette test and make it react with our peptide bonds, we're going to need two things. The burette test is actually two substances. Sodium hydroxide, because we're gonna to need to make it a little bit alkaline to see it once the reaction has finished, we're going to need to react the amino acid or the peptide bonds to, to show them. So we're going to make this a little bit more alkaline. So we're gonna need sodium hydroxide and then we're gonna use copper sulfate. And copper sulfate is the second part of this test. These two things together comprise the Brett test. And so we're gonna to need to use these things in order to, to see how our amino acids, if we have digested this down into smaller polypeptides and even individual amino acids. So basically, 
this particular indicator is going to be a two-step process requiring sodium hydroxide and copper sulfate are icky, I call it icky, or iodine potassium iodide, which is very similar to Lugol solution, both using potassium iodide, is going to indicate the presence of starches. Benedicts will indicate the presence of monosaccharides. So we can see how well our pancreatic amylase digested our substrates. So all of our macromolecules, since they will be, the reaction will be catalyzed by an enzyme. Obviously, we're going to call these our substrates. And as you recall, the way the enzymes work is they're basically going to facilitate this reaction because these reactions could go by themselves, but it would take millennia. So basically, they have such a high activation energy that they just don't occur spontaneously in nature. And that's why we have enzymes. Enzymes are protein molecules that, as you recall from previous lectures, they will facilitate the meaning of two things. So it's just like these two markers. If they're just bouncing around in space and they're hitting each other randomly, the likelihood that they're going to form a bond is very unlikely. But if an enzyme comes along and puts these things together in the exact orientation to where they will bond, then we have formed that bond. And the likelihood that these markers sitting here spontaneously will form a bond is about, well, very unlikely, unless an enzyme comes along and puts them together or facilitates such a meeting that they will naturally form a bond. So the energy to form a bond, it takes energy to form a bond. And basically what's going to happen is you're going to want to reach a lower energy state by the end of it. But there is still nevertheless an activation energy. So if we just review very quickly sort of the actions of enzymes, then what we know is that our starting state, we have a certain energy for the starting state. And typically our ending state is going to be lower than our starting state. But we have to have, well, there is an energy barrier. So there could be an energy barrier. And whereas, you know, this thing might want to get down here. And let's just say it's going to break apart in two different things. And this is a lower energy state here, which would be favorable because things always want to move from higher to lower energy. But there's a barrier here. And so this thing has to get up over this barrier. And in a lot of processes in nature, this barrier is quite high. So you're just not going to get the energy that you need in order to make this reaction go. However, if by adding an enzyme, for example, then you can lower the activation energy. And that makes it much easier for this thing to find its lowest energy state. So this reaction would run. And this substrate here, which would be the reactant in the reaction, can then become the product. Because we can lower this activation energy with an enzyme, and that enzyme will allow this reaction to proceed, where otherwise in nature, without some kind of facilitation, we would almost never reach the energy level that we would need in order to carry this reaction to completion.